Hi students, welcome to HSC Biology and Module 6, Genetic Change. This is video number 8. We're going to just review really a lot of what we already know now about genetic variation. So in this video we're going to investigate some of the causes of genetic variation relating to the processes of fertilization, meiosis, and mutation. So we need to, to be able to describe several sources of genetic variation to explain how variation can occur during meiosis and to look at each of those processes I mentioned, fertilization, meiosis and mutation as sources of variation in a population. So we know there's lots of places now where, there, uh, where variation can occur and this is a very important driver of evolution through natural selection. So in order for natural selection to operate, we need firstly to have variation within populations. And that's so that the selecting agents, whatever they may be, whether they're environmental changes, changes in the preference of particular uh, prospective mates uh, in prey or predators, each of these selecting agents needs to operate on variation within populations. Now some of the variations that we've looked at so far are really about mixing the genes that are already within the gene pool. So the most um, simple example of that, of course, is fertilization. When you um, look at the process of sexual reproduction where the sperm meets the egg, there's a random number of sperm with a whole range of different cells that are produced through that process of meiosis that can, again, um, interact and uh, fuse with any of a huge combination of different types of eggs. So literally the, the variations are endless when we're talking about fertilization. We now know that mutation is a change in the sequence of, uh, uh, in the DNA. So the sequence of bases, the coding for particular amino acids in a protein, uh, sometimes whole sections of uh, chromosomes or whole chromosomes themselves can be changed. And as a result of that, there can be quite significant changes that happen uh, to the organism. Many of those changes may be neutral, some of them may be disadvantageous, but some of them may actually create advantages for individuals. And if they're selected positively for, then those newly created alleles may then start to become um, higher in terms of their frequency within a population. One of the things that we'll just quickly review in this video are these three processes that are very closely linked to the process of meiosis, random segregation, independent assortment, and crossing over. Now, I probably should say right at the front here that, that random segregation and independent assortment are often used interchangeably. And so what I'm gonna do is give you kind of my overview of what I think is going on here, remembering that when we're talking about individual alleles within the chromosomes, what applies to chromosomes moving around also applies to alleles. But hopefully with the um, contrast I'm looking at between random segregation and independent assortment, you get a little bit of an idea about what, what the difference between those two is and why they're important sources of variation. So we know that alleles of particular genes occur in pairs on an individual. Um, in an individual on each of a pair of homologous chromosomes. So um, during the process of fertilization, what has happened is that we have an individual that has gained uh, two sets of chromosomes from two haploid cells. And this also is a haploid cell. And the result of that is we have um, this diploid cell which we've represented by the uh, notation 2N, indicating that there's two copies of each of the chromosomes. So there's only four in this particular cell, and we tend to draw these in simplified form so that they, um, we can actually show what's going on without trying to draw 46 that you'd have in humans. So the, the important thing about uh, random segregation is random segregation is about the lining up which occurs during meiosis of these homologous chromosomes. So this is one of the little differences between mitosis and meiosis, just in terms of the way that the cell division process uh, occurs. And the reason for that is because we're going to actually divide our cells up in order that they will go from diploid cells back to haploid cells. 
One of the things about the formation of these haploid cells is that the combinations are random. That is, uh, when the homologous pairs are lining up, they don't, we can't just assume that they're all going to line up in maternal ones on one side and paternal ones on the other side, and that you're going to get, uh, you know, every other uh, gamete is going to have all of the chromosomes from your mum and all of the chromosomes from your dad into the other one. The way that that works is entirely random. In fact, it's um, two to the power of 23 different combinations that you can have in humans. And so that's a lot of different combinations. So um, what that means is that when the pairs of homologous chromosomes separate during that process of meiosis, as the gametes are going to be formed, each cell or uh, each egg cell or each sperm cell is only going to contain one of each homologous pair. But there's no order to whether or not the two... So you can see here we've got two. Uh, the blue is paternal and the red is maternal. So we've got uh, two paternal ones here and two maternal ones here. Over here we've got uh, one maternal, one paternal, and likewise one paternal, one maternal here. Now obviously the, the range of... Um, possibilities is much smaller when you have only a small number of chromosomes. But the bottom line is that when we're looking at how these cells are being formed, the key to this is, and I've kind of drawn them as, as what chromosomes are rather than the chromatids, so um, diagrammatically there are um, some, some holes you can poke in this, uh, in this diagram, but the, the key point that I want to share with you is this, random segregation for me, is about the chromosomes and which of the two homologous, two of the homologous pair goes into each of the gametes. So this is about separating the chromosomes or segregating the chromosomes from one another. Now, of course, when you do that, you're also going to be separating um, genes or alleles from one another as well. But for me, when we talk about the alleles and how they're um, separated, that's something slightly different. That's independent assortment. Now, independent assortment to me is talking about the gene level or the alleles. I'm quite happy with you using either of these terms uh, because we're looking at where the individuals are going. So it's, so it's easier for us probably to talk about the alleles than it is anything else. So you can see now we've got these chromatids, they've, they've multiplied and now they're going to segregate out as they form the gametes. So you can see now we've got the gametes down here and we've done our random segregation, which means we've been able to separate our combinations of uh, chromosomes out. But now what we're looking at is the combinations of these individual genes. Now you can see the combination now we're looking for in terms of our alleles is we've got a big A and a big B here, a little A and a big B here, a big A and a little B here, and a little A and a little B here. Now this is one of the important assumptions around Grigor Mendel's work, but we actually know independent assortment does not always occur. It's, it's pretty much guaranteed when these sorts of situations happen because you've got here two alleles for two completely different genes that are on two completely different chromosomes. And so therefore, they're pretty much always going to be assorted independent of each other. However, what if we had uh, C? If we put C here, if we put C here, and we say C is uh, another one right close to where A is, then you can see that A and C are not actually going to assort independently. A and C are going to go together as a pair. And there may be certain characteristics, certain pairs of traits that you might associate as being often inherited together. Um, the classic one that's often used in this case is red hair and freckles. Uh, so these are not assorting independently. And in fact, it was their understanding of how independent the assortment of different genes was, or at least different alleles was, that actually allowed us to work on mapping the chromosomes. So we knew that um, sometimes even if these genes are on the same chromosome, they can still be assorted independently. We can still see some crossing over happening, which separates those alleles out and creates some new combinations. But that won't happen, or it'll happen very, very rarely, if the two alleles are almost right next to each other on the same chromosome. 
So this is about a number often of different types of alleles that you find uh, on each chromosome and how those genes are being inherited as well as how they're being segregated in terms of the chromosomes. So the two concepts are, are related, they're closely related, you can't have independent assortment without random segregation, they do all go around, but there is a, a point where you can have uh, these alleles not necessarily assorting independently, they could be dependent on one another if they're very close together on the same chromosome. And the other thing that we've talked about which happens during meiosis is crossing over. And crossing over, we've gone through this a number of times, so what it does is it introduces these new gene combinations. And this is where we can talk about um, this whole process of um, new combinations of independent assortment of genes where we say, well look, we would like to think that uh, maybe A and B, if they're on the same chromosome, will be um, inherited together, so the two, chrome, two, the two um, alleles will actually go into the same gamete uh, with each other as a pair, um, but crossing over can also separate them as well. So here we, we would expect um, the little a and the big B to stay together and the big A and the little b to go to stay together, but because of crossing over you can see we've got this big A, big B combination. So again we're shuffling. Notice one of the important things that's happening with, with all of these types of variation, random segregation, independent assortment, and crossing over, is we've got all of these alleles here present already in the gene pool, we're just mixing them around a little bit. But if we're going to get natural selection operating, then we're going to have to be able to introduce some new alleles in there, some new genes, some new combinations, some new proteins perhaps that are going to be the physical expression of those genes. And that means that we've got um, a couple of levels in which we can look at variation and hopefully as we go through each of these you'll now be able to mark them off um, as things that we've covered uh, in terms of variation. So at the individual level, obviously one of the things that we're looking for is gamete combination, which is uh, fertilization, which produces the individual in the first place. We've got mutation, which is the change, and that's often where we get a lot of our new alleles. And then in meiosis, we've got independent assortment, we've got random segregation, we've got crossing over, and these are all things that are happening during that process of meiosis. And of course, mutation itself can actually happen during that um, replication process in meiosis. But we can also look at variation in the population level, and we've started to do a little bit of that, a, a gene flow where genes actually move from um, one population out, they immigrate to a different population, uh, maybe two ponds which are separated and then it rains and then now the ponds maybe are, are now sharing the same sort of area body of water and so um, two populations which were separated now can intermix and so the genes can flow again or you can have um, random genetic drift we've talked about that as just um, things that happen sometimes um, that happen randomly there's no real selective agent maybe it's um, humans clearing some land or putting a, a, a major highway between two regions where uh, maybe some native animals used to cross from one to the other and now they can't. Um, and then natural selection itself, which obviously is going to operate on that variation uh, and start to shift some of the, um, at least, uh, proportions within different populations. So there's a lot of um, there's a lot of drivers for natural selection in terms of variation. A lot of mechanisms by which variation can be increased in at the individual level and at the population level. And remember, when we talk about mutations that are occurring in the germline, we're talking about uh, changes that can be inherited by subsequent generations. So hopefully this, um, it, most of this should have been just a bit of a, a review, a revision, to just pull together some of these key sources of variation. And we'll look a little bit more at gene flow and genetic drift in the next video. Thanks for watching.